All right. So in this part, we're going to talk about the embedding approach applied to our uh, sentiment analysis problem, which is essentially a text classification problem. Before that, I want to quickly cover some concepts about the previous approach, bag of words, for some of you who might not be quite familiar with those. Uh, one of them quickly I can talk about is removing stop words as a normalization technique. So stop words, you know, you can search stop words and see like bot and a, a, n, i, and so on, that, there. Uh, these are stop words that are appearing a lot in text, but don't um, say too much about the topic of that text. But as always, make sure that you always try things with removing stop words or without removing stop words. For instance, some best solutions might entail keeping stop words in your document or might just go with a subset of stop words rather than all stop words, all standard stop words. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, term frequency and uh, inverse document frequency technique. So in our small example, dog is playing. If you look at the term count, uh, all of these uh, tokens are appearing once and the same for document two. Now term frequency is defined over a word in a document D. And uh, IDF is defined over just the word for that corpus of documents that we have. These are two simple definitions. Uh, there are variations of these two functions, but this is the gist of it. So you can see that other variations are coming from the same idea. So this is saying that term frequency of word in a document is defined as the number of times that that word appears in that document, essentially the frequency of that word divided by the number of tokens in that document D. So essentially it's normalizing it with respect to the length of that document. An inverse document frequency of word W is defined as log of total number of documents in the corpus divided by total number of documents containing that word W. And the TF-IDF means we multiply these two functions together. So for instance, in our example, TF of dog in document one is one, which is the number of times dog appears in that document divided by three, which is the length of that document. So um, if, if we had a longer text, multiple sentences or longer text and all that, and then dog appeared five times, this could be five divided by, by the length of that document, which is maybe 20. But sometimes you might just define the frequency as a binary frequency, then it would be either 0 or 1 divided by the length of the number of tokens. So number of unique tokens in that sense. So uh, IDF of dog is now log of 2. We have only two documents in our corpus divided by 2. Both documents contain dog, so it would be 0. And IDF of playing would be 1. Now you can compute the TF-IDFs accordingly. So now dog is suppressed that its value is uh, brought down to zero. And playing's value TF-IDF is 0.33 and you can also compute other, uh, other ones. So now document one, the feature vector for that would be 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0, 0 versus the previous one, which was uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. So essentially, this uh, first entry, which was representing dog, is now suppressed to zero. So relatively, this dog doesn't relay that much information compared to these second and third entry. So now you can see how TF-IDF is uh, increasing the power of some terms and decreasing the power of some other terms. Respectively. So now let's uh, go to our embedding. All right, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, the concept here, and then we get to our example. So what embedding is doing is essentially taking the um, features from the bag of words, and then it will do dimensionality reduction to reduce the uh, dimension of that space. So remember in bag of words, we had a lot of features, our feature space was huge because it was coming from the tokens in our 
the corpus. But essentially, that might go beyond the limits of our computing. So we need some ways of doing uh, feature reduction in a smart way. And um, how we do it in embedding is that, to show you an example, is uh, remember that corpus that we had, document one, document two. So now we say, okay, we want we want to project this uh, feature space instead of six dimensional space. We want to project it to a dimension of a space of dimension two. So essentially, it will do its magic, and then dog is now mapped to this two dimensional point. Is is mapped to this dimension two dimension. Th these are just my own random uh, two dimensional vectors, but just um, to give you the idea and so on and then at the end again document one is representing by adding these um, um, dog is playing vectors or uh, dog two is obtained by adding it, the corresponding vectors um, so this adding that I'm saying sometimes is done uh, by averaging or you know there are always uh, and there are some, sometimes research showing that it doesn't matter because you are at the end doing some normalization on the feature vectors so uh, th th this is just to give you an idea of what, what's happening in um, embedding approach. So essentially features dimension is reduced in embedding. So instead of, for instance, having a feature space of 60,000, now you have a feature space of 100 dimension which is way less than that 60,000. And uh, the way uh, this is done is that we will take, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, gonna give you a high level idea. Details uh, are better to be searched, I would say, uh, or maybe later I might have some video on that. I, I won't promise this, but uh, it would be a bottleneck uh, structure. In War 2 Rec uh, case, we have uh, like this, something like this, which is a neural network with one hidden layer and one input layer. Input layer will get uh, the features, I mean the words or the tokens are represented by that uh, one hot encoding that we had above here. So like this one hot encoding, or essentially it could be this, I mean the TFIDF is running on top of that, but essentially it's a one hot encoding given in the input layer and then it passes through a hidden layer of uh, smaller dimension, like if you want to, in this case, it would be like dimension two or you might have dimension 100, depend, like if your one hot encoding has dimension 100,000, then you might want to go with dimension 300, depends on, on uh, how you want to define it. And then the apple layer would be, again, something that is uh, predicting some words based on how you define this network. But anyways, this uh, hidden layer is the most important one. And the embedding vectors are computed once the network is trained and we use the weight matrix of the input layer and the activation of the hidden layer and the weight matrix of the output layer to compute those uh, embedding vectors. So I'm not gonna go into details, but essentially having this uh, bottleneck approach will force your features which are one hot encoding to pass through a smaller space and then that space is going to represent your work from now on once you train this neural network it will you know eventually these weight values will converge and become stable and then those values would be would be representing your um, tokens or words so there are many examples of um, Embeddings, war 2 vec is the one, the most famous one, the, the one that started and showed that it's beating many other complicated techniques. I, I want to mention that this bottleneck technique is, is kind of something similar to matrix factorization or collaborative filtering, if you guys are aware of those techniques. At the same time, matrix factorization, it might not be easy to do it, I mean, in this problem, because of the, the, the complexity of that problem. This is, this is somehow making this matrix factorization a kind of a numerical problem. Now you can numerically like train that model to, to use the stochastic gradient descent to kind of converge to, to weights that you kind of want. I would rather not to go into details because um, I, I kind of don't wanna, this, this is not the purpose of this uh, tutorial. 
this embedding is trying to also make use of the semantic and synthetic of the um, the text that it reads. So essentially, the words that have the same meaning or usage, they are going to be embedded uh, close to each other in that uh, space. And um, one canonical example coming from this property is this like if uh, you take the word embedding of uh, Paris, you subtract uh, the embedding of France from it, and then you add uh, the embedding of Germany, you'll get the embedding of Berlin. This is essentially uh, easy to, to have. This is, this is a nice and smart way of representing it. Uh, but essentially, as long as uh, Paris and, Ger and, Paris and uh, Berlin, their points in that space, that um, embedding space, are kind of close to each other, and France or Germany are close to each other in that space, this will happen. So, uh, or you could have other examples like Tehran minus Iran plus Germany would, would become Berlin. Again, as long as Germany, f France, Iran are kind of uh, falling into the same cluster in that um, space and also the, their capitals are falling into the, the same cluster, the distance, the distance between the vectors will imply this, these equations. So you will see a lot of nice uh, such equations regarding embeddings. So one potential issue is that uh, some words have different meanings. And this has been the, one of the motivations behind BERT. BERT is the one that was developed by Google Research. You guys can go and uh, see more about it. But the embedding in BERT is different. It's not a simple uh, neural network as the one in Word to WEC. Or globe. So um, to remind you, war to wick or in general, these embeddings are done in two different ways. One is uh, continuous bag of words. The other one is skip gram. In continuous bag of words, you're assuming that um, uh, you you give the the context here, and then you are predicting the the missing word. And in skipgram, you, you are giving a word here, you are predicting the context. These are de more details just to remind you. And uh, so Fastex, Fastex is uh, similar to war to wick but it works at uh, character engram level rather than word engrams. war to wick glove, etc are working at the word level, but Fastex has more power because it works at character engram. And the other thing, good thing about Fastex is its speed. It, it beats uh, many other complicated networks, deep networks, I would say, like RNNs or, you know, LSTMs on some benchmark problems in a way shorter amount of time. It's coming from uh, uh, Facebook AI research team. If your corpus is large, like Wikipedia, computing the embeddings for war 2 vec or Glove or any of those could be uh, computationally heavy and not everyone has the resources to do that. So larger tech companies like Facebook, Google, uh, they normally run the um, training on those large corpuses and then at the end they will save those uh, embedding vectors somewhere with public access so everyone can use those. Okay back to our embedding example so let's open up the notebook so first of all uh, this is the same problem the same uh, data set that I, I linked to previously this is coming from Kaggle and uh, everything is similar except that for this problem we're using embedding approach and for doing that I'm using Fastex. Fastex is a package by Facebook and I have installed the latest version at the time which was uh, 0.8.22 and I am having some references here. So if you check those references, uh, it's always good. this is the main page. You will see many things like uh, 
these are the embeddings that are computed, pre-computed for you by Facebook. There are 157 different languages. Also, they have computed word embeddings for those languages. There is this tutorial here that I have also linked here as well. So, uh, especially the supervised, so text classification. I strongly suggest you to go over this if you want to get more familiar with FastX. It's super easy to install FastX, first of all, and then run the um, command line interface instructions here to get an idea. So it has a simple co co cooking example to show you. Um, it's all in the command line interface. You would, you would do it in terminal and then uh, you will get a good idea of what it is. Especially this is, so it has two ma major parts as of now. So FastX is changing very fast and there's always updates and all that. There are bugs that people are reporting and getting fixed. So there is one supervised part, which is for text classification, and the other one is for word representation. This is unsupervised, and this is just for generating word uh, vectors, or essentially the, the embeddings. So, uh, and if you check down here, you will see also some uh, quick description of SIBO continuous bag of words or scriptgram, how, how they work, like an example. Like given the context, find the word, or given the word, find the context, stuff like this. And um, nearest neighbor queries, like finding words close to something like asparagus uh, in that um, uh, embedding space is close to beetroot, tomato, horseradish, and so on. Or those examples that I gave you about Paris and stuff uh, and all that, like remember, like Berlin, Germany, France. So if you do Berlin minus Germany plus France, you would get Paris. So or or other cities like Bourges and so on, Toulouse. But essentially, the closest one is Paris. So that's that's the result of some properties of the way points are mapped into that uh, embedding space. Another example here. I strongly advise you to look at this and you, you will see the list of options here too. So these are the input arguments, let's say for supervised function of FastX and you, you will see the description, but, but there's a huge, but that it's not always like this. This is, this is the original, uh, CLI package and it is the major one that is supported right now. There is this unofficial Python one that we are going to use. Things mentioned here, especially the, the default values are not necessarily the default values in Python. Just uh, remember that. And also sometimes there are some uh, discrepancies between that Python version and th this version here. I'll mention one at least later. All right, so this is about it. And yeah, you can, uh, for this Python package, you could go to this GitHub page they have and uh, you will see the requirements, mostly you, you, you probably have them and then there are two ways to install the Python package. It's, it's straightforward, you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have any problems with that. Cool.